Okay, everybody, we have our first game of the day. We're currently looking at the first round of the DreamHack Tours Qualifier, which is the second regional final for Europe. And Infernal Shrines is our first map in the game between the Evil Murkeys and Morgan's Minions. If you're familiar with the European server, you definitely know the two teams. The Evil Murkeys are French. I can never remember where Morgan's Minions are from. I think they are from Sweden, but they might be from Finland. I'm pretty sure that they're Swedish, though. Um, but yeah, I always mix the two of them up. Shame on me. So we have our first round, and uh, whoever wins this series is going up against Team Liquid in the next round. I'm not alone today either, because I'm with Tetra, and we're going to bring you the coverage of our first game. This is very true. So having a look at the draft here, Zool, the first ban, very unsurprising on this map. He's still very strong and has insane clear for the Shrine fight. So a very sensible ban. And also Illidan, he got touched a little in one of the recent patches, but still seems pretty solid. Illidan got definitely touched in all the right places. He's incredibly strong right now, and it's one of the preferred picks of most of the teams. Especially with the double support, he is amazing, and he can wreck your backline like the, like I mean, it's insane. So he's incredibly strong. He's one of the preferred bands this, uh, these days. And we have so many heroes, actually, where the teams are just saying, like, yeah, this hero is totally OP. And with all of the heroes being OP, more or less, it's a pretty cool scenario that we have right now for Heroes of the Storm, because the games are incredible fun. And when you're looking at the draft here with Evil Murkies picking up Greymane and Liming, it's already a huge amount of damage output that they currently locked down for themselves. But Morgan's minions with an interesting start into the draft going for, well, a very CC heavy double front line here. Oh, yeah. and Ginge, thank you very much. Ginger actually had a very interesting animation a bit earlier where he face rolled the keyboard and the text to speech was pretty amazing with that. So uh, let's see what's gonna happen now. But wait, there is more. Correct, thriving spark fasting burn jadir boo fab zoon jif fazoon fall so lily chibi please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, like this text to speech bot is pretty damn good, I have to say. Yeah, definitely is keep it up. It's, it's doing a good job. Oh dear. Yeah, I, re I really like what Morgan's minions have done here, though. With uh, Evil Murky's taking two really high power damage dealers, uh, limiting Morgan's minions' options for their second one, they instead get huge priority onto the first two warriors. And uh, Evil Murky's still responding quite sensibly by banning out one of the supports. Probably the best one to go with multiple warriors, because you can get that lightning shield on and get a lot of damage output on it. Uh, so, And Evil Murky's do get the first pick on support afterwards. So it does help them out quite a bit. Oh, yeah, even Merc is actually in this case also with the Leoric that they're currently considering uh, taking since they have of course a hit point heavy Muradin against them. So Drain Hope would already be great and if you go into the Paralyzing Rage on level 7 you get pretty nice control over the front line of your opponent. I wouldn't be too surprised to see a Thrall if they really go for Leoric here or at least a second warrior at his side. But Morgan's minions they already banned out Sonya. So it's definitely an interesting approach. We have Malfurion taken over that, and this is actually like very much Evil Murkies. If you watched a few of the games of the French team, you know that they really prioritize Malfurion very highly in their drafts. They really like that support a lot, and it's a little bit uncharacteristic for the current state of the meta. We see Malfurion every now and then, but he's not really like one of those top priority picks, and especially with Greyman, it's more focused on Uther to enable the, uh, well, ranged slash melee assassin to really go into the back line and deal out the damage. So definitely a very evil murky style pick here going into that Mil Milfurion for their support. Yeah, but it isn't just a comfort pick for them. It does actually make quite a lot of sense due to Malfurion having that innovate. And they're taking two fairly mana intensive heroes from when they're actually poking from range, which is quite important on this map because you're going to be poking on those shrines for quite a long time. But like you said, it does give Uther over to Morgan's minions, which means Divine Shield Mosh Pit is completely available here. It surprised me a bit that they went for Malfurion. I mean, we of course know that Evil Murky that they love their Malfurion, but after they banned out Rhaegar, I personally assumed that they would try and pick up Uther to enable Greymane to jump into the backline. So the problem that they have with not picking Uther is that, as you already pointed out, Morgan's minions have now the option to go Mosh Pit into Divine Shield, or the other way around. And that is yeah. incredibly powerful if you are playing on one of the shrines. So a bit more damage on the side of Morgan's minions would be a nice thing. There's a couple of options of what you can go for. Vala has become incredibly popular, but there's a couple of other heroes, of course, that you can still play with this particular setup. And KT is another option option. He brings good AoE damage to the table, but they seem to be heading into a J9 stat, which of course, after a mosh pit, can always get that Ring of Frost plus Blizzard in. Yeah, they do have a hell of a lot of crowd control here, so having oh, yeah. that J9 is going to be absolutely lovely for them. 
And uh, they, that also means that Uther could, in theory, use the Divine Shield on Jaina for protection, seeing as she is going to be the target of most stuff, due mm -hmm. to the fact that Evil Murky is, you can count the ways that they can interrupt ETC without heroics on zero hands. Interesting for me personally is what's going to be the last pick on the Evil Murky side, because think about it, Thrall, an early pick in most of the drafts, hasn't even been touched yet, so he's still open. Yeah. But into Stitches and Tyrael, both of them have actually like very like, like a lot of value. You could go Stitches if you want to go into the Slam build. If you go into Tyrael, then you have the option to simply use that Sanctification, which can help you against the mosh pit of your opponent, which can help you against Jaina with all that Blizzard damage. If you head into Stitches, then you have a little bit more AoE damage for the Shrines themselves, and they decide that that is more valuable to them than sanctification. So we're going to see that Stitches Leora combo at the front with very good damage dealers in the back line and the Malfurion to heal out the opponent's damage. If you're going to see the Gathering Storm build, which is very likely on Falstead, and also, of course, that Blizzard focus for Jaina, then Malfurion with his Tranquility can definitely do a lot here. But it all hinges on Morgan's minions' ability to really use those two lockdown warriors to get the stuns in and also in the mosh pit. So, guys, Infernal Shrines is game number one. We're going to jump in right now to find out which team is going to take the lead here in the first round of the qualifier for DreamHack Tours, the second regional final in Europe, with Evil Murkies going up against Morgan's minions on Infernal Shrines. Game number one, everybody, between the Evil Murkies and Morgan's minions. To the left side of the map, we have the French team with Q on Malfurion. We're seeing Tank for the win. Guess what? On the tank. He's playing Leoric. Donatan is playing Stitches. And we have Arakane on Li Ming with Tic Tac on Greymane. To the right side of the map, we are seeing, uh, of course, now the Swedish team and uh, Morgan's minions with Valkatten on Falstad. Tazo has been a very bad boy and has been silenced as he's playing Muradin. We have Knapper on Utha, Lauber on ETC, and Bosse is playing Jaina. The map is Infernal Shrines, and well, as already mentioned during the draft, I'm not alone here. I have some reinforcements from the UK. Tetra is going to help me out here with the cast today and, of course, the analysis. Indeed. So for now, we are going to see the start of the game where we're trying to see a little bit of hook catching out from uh, the evil murkies here. Morgan's minions, they went a very long way around to make sure that that didn't happen, but they do have a get revealed by stitches and decide to just rotate round to the middle lane so they can try to go for that minion clear. Now, when it comes to the builds, we also see that false that did not go into the gathering power build, so we're Ooh. not going to see him with a mage stat, but instead it's the auto attacks that he's aiming for. Straight ahead with Season Marksman, and then of course we're going to see Power Throw, Power Throw and Secret Weapon for him. Malfurion, a pick that the Evil Murkies prefer as their frontliner, went into Moonburn, which is to be expected. But we're definitely going to keep a close eye on what those builds are, because with those new patches, there have been a couple of changes to a lot of these heroes. How did Arakame live that? He got hit by basically every single stun and was still able to get out of there. Very cool to see. But like you said, a lot of the heroes have been changed in little ways. But uh, most of the map, however, still the same. So we're likely going to see a, a little bit of an advantage for Evil Murkies in terms of poke potential on those shrines. Due to that Grey main, the Li Ming, if she gets a very good angle on her Arcane Orb, she's also going to be able to take out a lot of the demons come the objective time. Yeah, we have Rolling Like a Stone on level 1, Power Slide Talents here, the Lingering Chill for Jaina. And Jaina in particular is one of these heroes that we actually have to watch out for a little bit. Of course, a lot of her talents got moved around. For example, she lost Blink, and at the same time, her Ice Bug is now a level 20 talent, so that makes it a little bit trickier to really keep her alive, which is one of the reasons why we have such a heavy frontline right now for Morgan's minions, running a Muradin plus an ET you see, allows them, of course, a lot of CC control at the front line, but at the same time also to create space for that back line, and that's going to be very, very important. The Shrine fights are going to be really interesting, since there's going to be that huge threat of a mosh pit after level 10, but well, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Right now, we're going into level 4, and also the first Shrine that has just been spawned up at the top lane. Yeah, right now, Falstead, the only person up here, but we're seeing a big rotation from the Evil Murkies to take control of this area first and get a big head start. Leoric just staying in the bot lane, soaking as much XP as he can, because it's very unlikely he will get picked off because of it. But uh, yeah, Falstead taking the power for us, so he's obviously just going for the full auto-attack based build. 
So we'll be taking the secret weapon on the next level. Yeah, sorry. Inferno Shrines is actually like a very interesting map when it comes to that because the meta on this map has changed a little bit. Like a lot of teams decided to not really go full YOLO on that first shrine, but instead focus experience a bit more. The reason for that is actually quite simple. If you don't overextend at the top when you're playing that with only four heroes, and you lose the Punisher, you can still be very much ahead in experience as long as you bait it in and burst it down right away. For now, on the other hand, a great hook is locking Valkatan down on his false stat, but Tic Tac is the one falling first. Nice combo attempt with Malfurion's roots, but it turns against the evil Murkies as Greymane is dying. So yeah, very nice attempt here, but the fight isn't over yet. Yeah, the huge amount of CC coming out of everyone on Morgan's minions, letting Jaden just drop all her damage. She was able to catch three heroes and really lower the health of the entirety of the evil murky. So a lot of them have had to fountain, but now that's given time for Morgan's minions to fountain as well. And they are still a hero up, so they're going to try and move in, tank for the win. Getting beaten up a bit, but he is going to be able to drain Tazu here. Yeah, and already we're having at the same time ETC sliding in. Stitch is in a bit of trouble and he's immediately attacked as Tazu jumps in too for the body block. Down goes Danatan, but we have false at very low while Katten eliminated and Tic Tac is jumping in on Uther, trying to eliminate Murden too. He gets slaughtered and that's a triple kill against Morgan's minions as Punisher number one ends up in the hands of the evil Murkis and they are starting to make their way over to the right side and push through the wall. Tic Tac cleaned a house there. He basically just <laughs> went straight into Morgan the second that Morgan's minions grouped up and just annihilated everything. And as such, his team do get a level 7 first. We have the clones on Malfurion. Definitely a smart move considering the <laughs> yeah. composition they're up against. Stitches bringing out the toxic gas, a little bit of extra damage. Tic Tac needs to be careful here, but there is that cleanse. There's the route to prevent anyone chasing and he is able to get out. Calamity has been taken, Stitches as kind of expected in the double warrior setup is of course going full damage at this point. And we have, interestingly enough, the Ghastly Reach taken. So Leoric had a couple of choices in this case. He could have either focused on just eliminating the front line of the opponent a little bit, or at least like making their life harder with the Paralyzing Rage. But him going into Ghastly Reach helps them to get the minions for the Punisher. So it's one of those choices that he had to make. Does he really want to add a little bit more control to the fight for his team, or does he want to help to just simply gain the objective? And he decided in favor of Ghastly Reach to make sure that he can just like clear those waves a little bit easier, and also the shrines themselves. So an interesting adjustment here to the playstyle. At the same time, though, we are also seeing on the opponent's side now, after the snowstorm, Frostbitten taken for Jaina. So it's all about that AoE damage here on this map at this point. Yeah, it does make sense. She is basically the majority of the AoE damage for her team, while the rest of the team focuses on keeping them still and just letting Falstad work out who's going to be the best target and using his single target damage to pick that person off. We're having cleanse, as Tetra already mentioned, on both sides now. And in the case, actually, like, I think Uther in this case could have really let cleanse go. Of course, there's yeah. always the root and there's always the hook, but it's one of those things that you can play around a little bit. But of course, if there's going to be another great hook against Fawcett, for example, and the root of Malfurion, then having that cleanse is definitely going to help you out quite a bit. This is one of those maps where we are, actually, like, Uther is one of those heroes after the globals that we've seen in Korea, where a lot of players have started to play a very different style on Uther, going into block, for example, on level one and playing more of a combat Uther, which is pretty interesting and something that a lot of the teams got from the Chinese. Yeah, the Chinese screen definitely is firing that nice use of March the Black King there by Tank for the win to survive. Very cool to see there. And he was just in time with that as he did hit a level 10. We have Tranquility on that Malfurion. The March of the Black King like we just saw. Putrefile on the stitches. The Wave of Force on the Leeming and the Go for the Throat coming in what? from the Great Main. Wave of Force, of course, a talent taken against ETC. ETC's Mosh Pit can be interrupted by it, and it's actually one of the talents that we see a lot these days, especially with the level 20 upgrade. It's incredibly powerful. And the cool thing about Wave of Force that a lot of people don't realize when they see it is that the cooldown is actually incredibly low as well. Same cooldown as Disintegrate, so 20 seconds, which is barely nothing. And yeah. that's pretty sweet if you are trying to just like use it to create a bit of space for you. Interrupt an ETC Mosh Pit, for example. It's a pretty good trade in cooldowns. But now we have the level 10 also available for Morgan's minions. Their problem, of course, is that it hits after the Punisher was taken by the opponent. And we have that Punisher immediately jumping in to put a bit more damage on ETC on the side of Morgan's minions. Yeah, and we are seeing the evil Murky is beginning to push up with this. They're going to be able to take down the fort at least. Alatan pushing very far forward here. Was thinking about trying to get some bile off, but decides against it. 
Punisher is going to get taken down, but they already have the fort, so we will just see the evil Murkies pull back here. Jaina still not chosen her heroic yet. She's just going to wait till the situation demands it. Yeah, Jaina is going to wait a bit longer for this. We have also Mighty Gust chosen, and keep in mind that Mighty Gust was actually changed in the last patch, so the cooldown is now up to a sec uh, to a 1 minion, 60 seconds, which makes a whole lot of sense. Talking about the cooldown, that was a big waste on the cooldown here, and we have Malfurion taken out shortly after that, but the kill against Oh Falstad. no, Greyfane! <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he managed to go for the throat, went, la ended up behind the wall, and he goes down as well, making it a two for one. Oh, the mosh pit! Well, two for two. <laughs> the mosh pit against the Ming, so, yep, it's actually a one for three in this case now. Great oh, play yeah. on Morgan's minion side with the Ring of Frost out chosen by Jaina. But that was an interesting start into a fight. First of all, we see Falstead with a big whiff on his uh, Mighty Gust, was trying to blast everyone away. Misses completely as Muradin uses exactly that, uh, sorry, as, as everybody else just like jumped over it. So it didn't really have the uh, intended effect. And then afterwards, they were able to at least get the kill against Malfury, but they lost three heroes as a result. So, uh, yeah, not really the fight that they were looking for here, at least initially, but then they end up with the triple kill, and that works quite well for them. But they are still behind in experience now. Yeah, they are a little bit behind. They, that is a huge part to, for them to catch up because they're about to become even on talents again. So they're going to be able to fight on even footing come at the next objective, which is going to be incredibly helpful for them. Yeah, and talking about the objective, I mean, we're looking currently Ooh. at level 13 talents with uh, not only an ice block, but we also have the burning rage. And that is going to make it much easier for the Auric to really get the extra minion stacks. The Mega Smash also, of course, another talent with a lot of AoE is going to make Stitch's life when it comes to minion collection much easier as well. But now we are having the next giant spawning, and this is going to be an interesting part now, because this is going to be the one fight on level 13 versus 13 talents, where Morgan's minions kind of have to make a bit of a play here. And in this case, we are actually seeing Giant Killer chosen for Falstead, with that auto attack build that he chose. And against heroes like Stitches, like Leoric, that's going to give him a lot of extra damage. So this is really where Falstead has to come through with his plays. By the way, on level 13, we are having the Ice Barrier now taken on the side of Jaina, to give her a little bit of sustain and safety during these fights. Yeah, giving her some protection in the form of that shield. It's only recently started coming into uh, being played at all, basically. The boss pushing forward here. So much CC on the side of Morgan's videos, but they're looking for an opportunity. Tazu a little bit out of position, but we'll be able to pull back this trait will handle most of that damage. Jada getting hooked, though. There is the Arcanor, but the Ring of Frost catches so many people. And the Mosh Pit, but it's... Oh, it's interrupted just in time. The Divine Shield is a little bit too late. Falsehood, on the other hand, is already down. And it's a double kill as Liming goes in for the damage. Now Murden dies too, and the team wipe is complete with Uther getting blown to pieces as well. Tank is completing the Punisher, and the rest of the team is already moving in. Oh my god, like that Lee Ming double kill and the amount of resets there was insane! Yeah, Lee Ming also was able to interrupt the mosh pit before the Divine Shield went down. So she was able to save her teammate there as well, as that could have maybe been a turnaround from Morgan's Minions. Instead, we're going to be seeing the Evil Murkies pushing in here with the Punisher onto the keep. Everyone is now alive though from the side of Morgan's Minions, so they're going to go very hard on the defense, but the keep is dropping very quickly. Yeah, the keep is dropping quickly. That Punisher, on the other hand, is not getting baited at this point. It's making sure that the keep is indeed eliminated, and it's an arcane Punisher on top of that. So they fail to actually bait the Punisher into the middle, finally starting to jump in, but the core is being attacked. And now with level 16 talents, we are seeing another huge lead for the evil Murkies. The Punisher is down, and they decide to move back right now, even though they have the talent advantage. Malfurion going into the hardened focus here, but they might be able to get a kill against Tazu, and that would be amazing for them. Here comes again Greymane with a kill. It's a double kill as Jaina and Muradin are being exploded. And this is an opportunity for the evil Murkies to end the game. Yeah, they're pushing in. Putrefile has been dropped. Tank for the win, just tanking up the damage here. And the core is down to half health. There is not much they can do. Here comes ETC for the stun. Falstad doing a lot of damage. Tic Tac just jumps him in. He gets Rick Ray, but it is too late. That will be GG. We will well see the played. Flash going over. Yeah, well played. Actually, really well done from the Evil Murkies, and the game number one ends in their favor here on Infernal Shrines.
So ladies and gentlemen, game number two is coming up on Cursed Hollow and we have Evil Murkies going up against Morgan's Minions. The Evil Murkies currently in the lead after the victory on Infernal Shrines and uh, let's find out what they can actually pull off here. Talking about bans once again, the meta is currently in a bit of a flux just because the last patch changed a lot of the heroic abilities which made a lot of heroes stronger and also a little bit more versatile in the way that they can be used. A good example for this would also be Johanna, who of course with the Blessed Shield had a lot of uh, function as just like interrupting uh, uh, opponent's heroes, but now with the increased damage on a talent like Falling Sword, she can get incredible damage out there, especially with battle momentum on level 7 for cooldown reduction. So it's something that we will probably see occasionally, and it changes the role of the hero just slightly. But Cursed Hollow is still Cursed Hollow, False is still False Dead, and even with those 20 seconds extra cooldown on the Mighty Gust, he is the king of Cursed Hollow, and that's why he is being banned first here, with the Morgan's minions taking down Illidan, because, well, he is just too damn strong to handle. Yeah, but that does, however, leave Zul open. The king of Split Push uh, is probably going to be picked up first here by the Evil Murkies. You can get the map control with the mages, you can get the damage with the poison nova, depending on what composition the enemy runs. Yeah, and well, Evil Murkies, they're all, uh, all about the old geezer here. Xul is actually like a hero that is prioritized by some teams, but not really by all of them. Heroes that we, of course, see very heavily focused on when we're looking at the pro scene are especially the Bruisers, a Thrall, a Sonya, an Illidan, for example. Any kind of frontliner, like a Greyman included as well, that can be enabled by Rhaegar, by Uther to jump the backline is incredibly powerful here. And it's actually kind of interesting. At some point, the, someone described what's happening here right now with one team saying, like, we would like to have the hot Asian chick, and the other saying, like, all right, give us the old geezer, we're fine with that. But not only Li Ming has been picked up by Morgan's minions, it's Grey Main as well. The damage potential out of the two of them you is pretty fantastic. And Aspera, thank you very much for the resub for 10 months, but... Yeah, right now, I mean, what do you think, Tetra? That damage potential that we have for Morgan's minions seems to be absolutely incredible. Do you feel like the evil Murkies made a bit of a mistake not picking up any damage this early in the game? Well, they do have many options in terms of damage. The Zul himself is still nice damage. They're hovering over Thrall as well, and with their stitches as a frontline, it means they're going to be able to gap close between Greymane and Li Ming very quickly with the hooks they land it. That's all they're basically going to be bum-rushing the backline with these three melee heroes and just attempting to get to them to really limit their range damage. And for Li Ming especially, if she doesn't take the teleport build, she can get in a lot of trouble when she's taken into point back fighting range. Mm. So, yeah, I, I like what Evil Murkies are doing. Morgan's Minions, though, we saw what this combination of assassins did last game, and it was pretty dangerous. What I would really like to see from Evil Murkies is a ban on Uther. I feel if Morgan's Minions have a shot at taking Uther and Greymane being unable to just, like, do his thing, that's going to be very, very tricky for Evil Murky. So denying Uther would probably be a good idea. Morgan's minions at the same time, they have to be a little bit careful about what they ban out right now. They could, of course, try and play the support game here, ban out Rhaegar, hope that they will get their hands on Uther, but it's always a bit of a gamble, because Evil Murky's, they already showed that they prioritize Malfurion very highly, so it's one of those heroes that most teams would not even consider picking. So if they suddenly start banning out supports, then Evil Murky's could just say like, yeah, you're not going to take Malfurion anyway, so we're fine with him, so we're going to ban an Uther, and then you're left with the scraps. With Morgan's minions not banning Rhaegar, they have a ban on Sylvanas now. They are basically guaranteed to get either Uther or get Rhaegar, but the evil Murkies, they don't seem really to care about what's going on here. They're just saying like, hey, you don't have a tank yet, and we're going to ban out one of the best. We're going to ban out Muradin. Yeah, and that Muradin ban makes a lot of sense, looking at evil Murkies' composition. Thrall. Very melee focused, that reverberation. Nazul, very similar. So getting rid of that Muradin, one, limits the tank options, like you said, and two, would uh, allow their melee assassins to do a bit more work. Instead, though, they decide to get rid of one of those people who can technically solo lane against the Roll Azul, they get rid of the Sonya. I would have banned ETC or Uther, to be honest with you. Uther for the reasons mentioned earlier, but when you are talking about like the big and heavy frontline that we have for Evil Murkies, I would be very much afraid of going up against an ETC. And... If you think about the space that he can create with his face melt and also, of course, the mosh pit itself, 
I would be very much afraid that Morgan's minions are jumping into that ETC and Uther combination once more. Because then they can use the Divine Shield either for ETC or they can simply enable Grey Mane there. And that would be something that I personally would be very scared of. So the Evil Murky is with a bit of a different approach. Banning out a Sonya when you have the Thrall is of course something that we have seen also for a long time. Since both of them uh, kind of fill the same role and you are trying to just enable a Thrall to go a little bit deeper without having to worry about Sonya. Morgan's minions, they react with Muradin. And we're going to find out now if they're going to pick their support, which I personally would actually like a lot because then they still have their last pick to be a little bit flexible towards what the evil murkies are going to do with their next pick pair. Yeah, and it's very unlikely that the evil murkies are going to steal away ETC from them. So they pick Rhaegar as opposed to Uther, which actually gives Uther over to the evil murkies if they want to mm. pick it. But uh, yeah, there's no way that the evil murkies are going to steal away ETC due to the fact that that would give them a zero in terms of range range damage dealers. Instead, the Lunara, and now we're seeing it is a bit of a comfort pick here, the Malfurion coming yeah. out again. They definitely like to play the Malfurion. Lunara for good damage. Rhaegar is an interesting choice here. Rhaegar is oftentimes a hero that you see more played with Thrall because he gets that lightning shield in, whereas Greymane doesn't really need that additional damage that lightning shield would give him. He has a damage output that's already absolutely insane, and Divine Shield makes his life a lot easier. Whereas on the other hand, of course, if you use the Ancestral Healing, it's oftentimes a bit riskier, a little bit tougher to use than Ancestral. But again, when you go for the Earth Shield, you at least have that small timing window. Earth Shield with Muradin, for example, could be quite nice here. And they go into a Diablo as their last pick, which is actually an interesting choice. Gives them a little bit more CC. I could have seen them head into ETC again after they already used the Muradin ETC combination in the last game. But Diablo, of course, is one of those frontliners that really punishes opponent quite severely. Yeah, it increases their damage output a hell of a lot, so they're going to be able to do some decent work here. Diablo is one of the heroes who can really hold the front line in terms of health against all these melee heroes. I agree with you, and I think the ETC would have been very solid. There, is a f there isn't a huge amount of CC, actually, on the side of Evil Murkies that would be able to interrupt it either. Like, there's Hook and there's Sundering. Mm. But other than that, there's not that much. Yeah, I kind of lean towards that. Yeah, I mean, usually I wouldn't really uh, like go into an ETC murder combo, but they showed already in the last game that's a little bit like some like a bit of a comfort pick for them too. In this case, they go for a different double warrior frontline though. The evil murkies they've shown their skills and coordination in the last game, and they are currently in the lead. Cursed Hollow is going to show if we have a third map between these two teams, or if we have the two O victory for the evil murkies, which would lead them into a match against Team Liquid in the next round. So guys, let's jump in right away and find out which team is going to take it here on Cursed Hollow. Game number two on Cursed Hollow, and we are starting again with the Evil Murkies on the left side of the screen. To the left, we have Malfurion played by Q, Danatan on Stitches, Tic Tac is playing Zul this time, Tank for the win is playing Thrall, and Arakin is on Lunara. To the right side of the map, the uh, Swedish team, Morgan's Minions with Valkatten on Li Ming, we have Knappo on Rega, Tazu on Muradin, Lauba on Diablo, and Bosse is playing Greymane, which actually gave them a lot of trouble in the last match, but right now they are using the Worgen to make sure that they can put the pressure on Evil Murkies. And Stitches again heading into that slam build that we already saw with great success in game number one. And as you can see, Malfurion has a solo heal again for the Evil Murkies. Definitely a comfort pick for them. They love to play with Malfurion, and that Stitches into root combo that they've been trying to use in the last game is something that they will also attempt to rely on once again. Yeah, they really seem to like it. It seems to work very well for them. And for now, though, both teams just trying to get the clear on the mid lane. This should easily go in favor of the Evil Murkies, thanks to Zool being a thing. And they do, in fact, get the first pick up very quickly and immediately split between lanes, abandoning the mid lane completely due to the fact they want to clear lanes as quick as possible. Yeah, and they have the lane clear to do exactly that. Wave clear in particular is, of course, incredibly important because it grants you a lot of vision on the map and that really helps. You're also having a few adjustments as the level 1 talent on uh, Rhaegar is now Wolfron, and Wolfron has become a lot more popular just recently. It gives you an additional 10% movement speed while you're in the Ghost Wolf form, and that puts you on the same movement speed that a mounted hero has, which is actually pretty cool since you of course don't lose any time when you're trying to move from one point on the map to another by trying to mount up since Rhaegar is one of the only heroes that can just jump into his form immediately. Yeah, it is very useful for him. We're going to see a bit of a root onto Diablo. No follow-up will happen here. Just a little bit of poke and a single tower shot over the Lord. But the tower, that does drain a lot of its ammo. It's already down to three ammo, but that doesn't matter because Li Ming just blows it up. 
Yeah, Li Ming taking down the tower at the top, but at the bot lane, as we could all see on screen a second earlier, we already have one tower eliminated, and it looks like Arakane and Q are aiming for the second one. Boss on Greymane just doesn't have anything against that. Murden, on the other hand, has been taken out in the mid lane. He was trying to jump away, apparently, but with Danatan and also Tic Tac being around, he was locked down and taken apart. So the early kill for the evil Murkies, even though they are starting to lose a few more structures up at the top, Li Ming is putting the damage in. The bot lane, on the other hand, is currently take it completely out. The wall is gone. Bossa has to even move back and that means they're also going to lose the well. Yeah, the well will go down. The minions are actually still be able to tank the shots here so they can do a little bit of damage to the fort. They won't be able to kill it due to Muradin and Greymane heading down and actually Rhaegar thinking about it as well or at least feigning it. So this actually could be dangerous for the people in the bot lane. In comes Muradin. Yeah, Muradin jumps in and so does Greymane. Man, the kill against Malfurion. Overall, ooh, Lunara, if she dies, yeah, that's going to change things a little bit now. Two heroes down. They are still in the leading experience, but you can see how Evil Murky's got a bit too greedy there. Overall, the opening at the bot lane for them was amazing. Like, taking down the entire wall, taking down the well, which, of course, like, takes sustain during this fight for the tribute away from the opponent's team is amazing. But they got a bit too greedy there, were trying to go for the fort immediately. Losing those two heroes, overall still worth it for them, but of course, they're not really in that lead in which they could have been. We are seeing them starting to fight for... Oh, no, the... Ah, oh, nice, Malfurion, actually, with the Moonburn there, using the moon fight to interrupt the channel, and now they can still fight for it, as also Thrall is joining the battle. Yeah, Thrall coming in from the side. Will it get immediately tackled by Diablo, but the root lands, and Diablo getting burst down, and he is taken out. Tank for the win, though. Having to back up, he took a lot of damage. Greymane gets pulled into everyone, and he will get taken out, and that is two for nothing in favor of the evil Murkies, and they will get the tribute. Yeah, really well played here. So once again, they get the kills. Three kills against two. And those two kills were, of course, against Mer against Malfurion and also Lunara when they got ganked at the bot lane. But the scenario for the evil Murkies is actually great. Not only do they get the first tribute, they continue with what they've been doing earlier and start to push the bot lane here. Lunara is putting incredible damage on. I could have actually seen her go straight into Nature's Culling here as a level 7 talent, which is very popular on the North American server still. And on this map in particular, can be very powerful since you can use it not only against the structures, but also against the bosses then later on. With the level 7 talent, we still have them in the lead, and follow-through has now been chosen for Thrall, with Zul heading into Radmar's Blessing. Yeah, he did take the Jailers on level 4, didn't go for that mana regen that we sometimes see on that level. But either way, he is going to be able to get some sustain, assuming he's near enough to a minion wave to just jump into it, clear it, get some push going, get some health back. So the, pretty much the standard talent for him. Yeah, the next tribute is also coming up on the map now. And three versus two, so let's see how this is going to go for especially Morgan's minions. Already position taken for the Evil Murkies, and they're going to aim for tribute number two here. Right now, though, we are seeing the Evil Murkies just sort of delaying this. They're not going for a huge dive onto it. The Roll and Zul were just still soaking top lane. Lunara still soaking slash pushing the bot lane, giving her team XP. So they are just going to let this one go while harassing it as much as they can. They get the hook onto Rhaegar and Stitches able to pull back without taking too much damage here so they are buying themselves a lot of time and a lot of xp for this yeah and they're trying to use thrall now to maybe interrupt again it's not quite working out and thrall is actually a little bit exposed dodges the storm bolt though oh here comes Greymane and tazu is on it as well but there's no stun yet nice they're able to escape and lunara is still doing her thing at the bot lane as danatan moves in now too but here's diablo and he's going to try and punish them now a five versus four situation they are moving back again and look at the experience though, level 10 is so close and Lunara, she's not able to eliminate the fall at the bot lane just yet but it was close and everyone on the side of Morgan's minions has to move back here and this is not really the situation that they were hoping for, they're losing the bot lane, they're not really gaining anything up here at the top and the only thing that they definitely got was that second tribute which is something that the evil murkies don't really care about too much. Hank though getting focused in the top lane to get a lot of damage, he gets taken down, Muradin super low, he dodges out the scythe though and he will get out of there so they do get a kill for this but they're still two levels behind heroics have been hit but it is just in time for this next tribute assuming they can get healed up by Rhaegar quick enough and they're going to be fine but like you said, bot forts down, mid fort actually dying as well. So they're just going to have to let this go. Yeah, at this point, with the level 10 talent, this is an easy pick for Q on tribute number two. And they find themselves in a very, like, in a great position. They're two levels ahead. 
More importantly, of course, it's the talent on level 10. We have Poison Nova now taken, the Thornwood Vine, Sundering, Putrid Bile, and also Tranquility have been chosen. And they can simply go for boss now, which is exactly what they're doing. There's still an entire level until we're seeing Morgan's minions with heroic abilities. So there's absolutely no threat to the evil Murkies here. They still show heroes on lanes as well, as they have in the middle Danatan, and also now Tic Tac starting to move in. The situation couldn't really be much better for the evil Murkies in this case. Yeah, they're going to be able to get the boss very easily in a lane that's already down to tier 2. So that is going to push up very aggressively. And that's going to keep uh, Morgan's minions busy for a very long time. They are able to get bruiser camps for themselves, which will at least take the pressure off this mid lane. Which has sort of been pushing passively thanks to uh, Zul appearing in that lane every now and again to keep it pushed. And Tetra, <laughs> look at the timing for the tribute. This is a curse tribute as well. Oh. But oh my god, what is Stitches doing? Danatan with a massive blunder here. He moves in for the vision, has no idea where the opponent is. All of a sudden, they have to let the tribute go. This is denying them a huge opportunity to not only go for another fort, but maybe even for a keep. That tribute would have never ended up in the hands of their opponents if not for this particular kill. Danatan, too greedy, goes for the vision, gets ganked and taken out. And in this case, the boss can of course be defended against at the bot lane. There's no curse helping them with it. That tribute would have meant curse against Morgan's minions. At least they get the kill at the top lane because of the boss being defended against at the bottom. But that was a huge opportunity that they just missed. Yeah, if they'd had the control and maybe got that curse, they may have been able to move in, get a huge amount of push potential with that curse, and then even rotate up to the boss while some of the lanes that they've just pushed were being defended. Instead, now they're in a much more risky position taking this boss. It's been scouted. It's a five versus five. There's not too many lanes pushing. This is a much tougher position for them. Yeah, and one of the problems, of course, I mean, they have the lead with the talent. That at least gives them a bit of an edge. But one of the problems that they also had is that we have now a situation in which everything can turn around depending on who wins this fight. And the boss is taken by the team in blue. Rega is down and so is Greymane. Everything working out for the evil Murkies after all. They get an entire team wipe against their opponent. They get the boss too. So after they found themselves in a bit of a shaky spot after Danatan dying just before that curse was about to be applied to the opponent, they find themselves in a great spot now. The boss is pushing again. Danatan is going for the curse right away. They have a three level lead. The boss pushing the top. Everybody dead on the side of Morgan's minions. And they are back to business and will aim for the first drop of a key. Yeah, the keep being pushed here. We're seeing a lot of the heroes, though, mounted up as opposed to hard pushing, so they don't want to get caught out by Diablo and Muradin here. And in fact, they're just going to pull back and let the boss deal with it. It might not get the kill. It's going to be quite close, in fact. But either way, it's going to put them in a position to take that down super easily themselves. Uh, at a later point in the game. Instead, they're doing a lot of damage to the tier twos in the mid lane, and they'll be able to take the fort down as they retreat. I really like that they went straight for the wall at the key because it makes perfect sense for them to do exactly that since the minions are going to take care of the fort as is. So they break the wall, they breach it. We have Zul now moving in up at the top. He's actually attempting to go straight for that keep, and they will get that if they just keep poking a little bit with heroes like Thrall and also Zul. Here comes our AK now too, and that's the keep. That's also level 16 versus this is level 12 at this point, so the talent lead that we are seeing for the Evil Murkius is crazy. They are two talents ahead with a Starwood Spear now taken with the unfair advantage. Malfurion goes into the Tenacious Roots now as a level 16 talent, and they are aiming for the second keep, and there's absolutely no reason why they wouldn't be able to pick this one up here. Yeah, they get it. Top keep. They were able to finish off two. So there's two keeps with that curse. All the bosses so far have been taken by the Evil Murkies. They are in absolute dominance in this game. And yeah, Morgan's Minions are one tribute away from a curse, but they would have to take down so much in order to bring themselves back into a fighting position. They won't be able to go for this at this point. I mean, when we're looking at the damage output, then it's actually not that crazy on the side of the Evil Murkies, but they have solid damage on heroes like Stitches, with even the most damage in the game so far on 22,000. Thrall also, here comes the Apocalypse on the other hand, not hitting really as much as they would like to. Tranquility has been popped. We have Danatan, very much isolated from the rest of the team on the other hand, and he's being dropped, but the counter kill against Li Ming makes sure that she can't capitalize on the cooldown reset. Once again, Muradin jumping out, eliminated still. It's a double kill, it's a triple kill, and they get the entire team wipe once more. And immediately, of course, the Morgan's minions are realizing that this is going to put an end to this game as everybody is starting to move through the middle of the map towards the core.
Yeah, and that's probably going to... Actually, no, it's not going to be GG because they don't really have enough time. We actually saw it called by Rhaegar there, but they don't really have enough time to push up before everyone is back. But during that last fight, it was a beautiful move by Stitches. He got himself a bit out of position, so instead of trying to push back through his team and getting maybe caught out and dying, he instead ran away towards the enemy base where they chased him because he was the one out of position straight through the Putrid Bile, grouping them up for Lunara to drop a huge amount of damage with the Thornwood Vine. It was a very nice move. And then ran back to his team so that he would just tank up a little more damage and stop them all running back to their base. Absolutely. The, the one thing that I kind of find a little bit funny is that the situation here was kind of nice. There's a team wipe in the middle and of course like talking from the way the game went and also the level set we're seeing here with level 18, the first reaction on the side of Morgan's minions was like, GG, game's over. They're going to move through the middle, they're going to take it, right? And then a second later, they realized, hey, we're only 11 minutes into the game. The cooldown <laughs> yeah. cool timers are so low we can actually not end. This game isn't over yet. So I kind of thought that was quite funny there. They go for, again, the Apocalypse here on the spot, and that battle is going to be a tricky one. But again, here comes the Sundering. Oh, nice heal. The problem is that Greyman is about to fall, and so is Rega. And Morgan's minions are just obliterated. It's team wipe after team wipe after team wipe. 18 kills against five. And this time, the GGs are probably a little <laughs> bit more serious. Yeah, uh, I can't help but feel we saw almost that exact fight before a little earlier in this <laughs> in this game. The exact same thing happened, but either way, we're going to see him push on to the core at this point. They're going to be able to take down the keep on the way, so the boss will join them even if they are all picked off here. And that looks like it's going to be GG. We will see Evil Murkies taking the 2-0. Yeah, it's a four level lead right now and they go for course. They're going to eliminate this. Well played by the Evil Murkies to take the 2-0 victory against Morgan's minions and successfully advance to the next round of the qualifier. Yes, yeah, so congratulations. They will find themselves going up against Team Liquid in the next round.